Lisa, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight and, and welcome to the Houston Climate Movement. Thank you for having me. I might be a little bit bleary eyed today with Commissioner's Court and it was still going on when I logged into this meeting. So, um, but good news, my item did pass uh, today about the ED pilot, which I'll talk about later. Uh, so, um, but I kind of wanted to keep this a little bit more conversational. Uh, don't have a prepared presentation, but I can give you some updates in terms of what's been going on at the county since I started in January. Um, and like Stephanie said, I, I see a lot of familiar faces, which is great. Uh, good to reconnect with uh, the environmental folks. I, hey, David, um, I've worked with, you know, over the last 10 to 15 years, but for those I haven't met yet, uh, my name is Lisa Lynn, um, Director of Sustainability for Harris County. Uh, have been in Houston since 2006. That makes it, um, I can't do math right now, six, <laughs> about 16 years. <laughs> um, so, but kind of, uh, you know, Stephanie alluded to, alluded to kind of my, my past work experience, but did start off in the world of architecture um, and kind of did that for about four to five years and really wanted to kind of dive deeper into green building, which is kind of where I started getting involved with the kind of local volunteering, community building, um, community organizing space. And uh, that's where I got to know David and, and Jamie really well, organizing for 350.org back in the early, early years, um, had a climate rally at City Hall, 2008, 2009, 2010, uh, got to go to some organizing, um, you know, trainings with, with 350 and One Sky back in the day. So, and, and, and Nancy, yep, Stacey Nancy here too. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that's kind of my background. Then from architecture, found myself uh, kind of jumping into the nonprofit environmental nonprofit world, working for local, uh, ICLE, local government sustainability, uh, that was housed within the Mayor's Office of Sustainability under Mayor Parker at that time. So was there supporting kind of other cities working on climate action um, and then had an opportunity to work with the city of Houston's uh, Office of Sustainability and worked with RSP Engine as a sustainability manager. Um, was in that role until 2017. So um, was there for a little bit of Mayor Turner's administration um, and then had an opportunity to um, launch the TDM program at Rice. So, uh, TDM is uh, Transportation Demand Management. So got to work with Madeline uh, when I was at Rice. Um, and um, in that time, I had another opportunity to go work for the city of San Antonio um, as their climate program manager uh, with their first climate action, climate action adaptation plan called SA Climate Ready. Um, so got to work with some of Adrian's uh, staff there and, um, and then came back to Houston and decided to kind of start on a master's program in Oxford on um, sustainable urban development. So I was doing that while I was working at Rice and just wrapped that up. This has been my dissertation the week I started at the county. So that brings us to somewhat present day and Jaime was one of my um, interviewees. Thank you, Jaime. <laughs> so, um, I will let you know how I got a merit on my dissertation. So thank you for your uh, contribution there. Um, so yeah, so <laughs> thanks, Jamie. Uh, so basically, yeah, have been kind of rocking and rolling at the county since since January. Um, I kind of wanted to sh just organizationally. I think there's been a lot of changes, and and admittedly, I was not really familiar with the county structure before I got to the county. Um, I've had experience working at two cities before I got there, and was basically kind of learning how the county functions. Um, so if you're like me. Uh, it took a couple of weeks to understand, you know, the dynamics between the county administration versus the precincts, um, and even our office is relatively new, Office of County Administration. So I might show this. Um, uh, oh wait, I can't show anything. Okay, um, so um, there's an organizational chart that I can probably, um, unless Stephanie, are you, like you are now co-host and can share okay. things. Okay. Because I think this will help kind of explain the structure of how we're operating in terms of like where we are. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. The organizational part. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. So if you can see the the cursor, um, this Office of County Administration is brand new as of last August. Um, if you've ever seen the county organizational chart before, this did not exist. Basically, all the departments reported up directly to the commissioner's court. So Basically, um, we now have a county administrator, which is pretty typical for, for um, large counties. This is where I sit within county in the county government. So what's great is that I, you know, can work really directly with all these different departments. So engineering, flood control, HECTRA, um, community services, which has a lot of the, you know, the affordable housing unit uh, development 
and um, Harris County Transit, which kind of complements Metro services, um, or complements or Metro does not service, excuse me. Public Health Department, um, Universal Services, which you know they have the Fleet Department, um, and then um, and I was going to mention Pollution Control Services. So this, in essence, is kind of what we have somewhat of you know a high influence. Everything else is kind of separate in terms of um, the the judicial system, and then and then the Commissioner's Court is kind of separate. You know, so if I want to partner with like Precinct One or Two. That there definitely needs to be that level of, kind of relationship building that needs to be established first before I can kind of pitch some ideas um, to folks. So just wanted to share that so you kind of get a sense of what we're dealing with. Um, so again, started in January, um, I'm an office of one, which is not a new feeling, but at this point in sustainability, it'd be nice to have more than one person. So the, the <laughs> uh, I do have an awesome intern who's helping me. We'll have a uh, an EDF Climate Court Fellow um, coming up in a couple of weeks, as well as uh, a Rice um, CCL uh, summer intern too. So I'll have some intern help. And so that really necessitates me to kind of start building relationships with these other departments to find these sustainability champions so that we can kind of create this internal working group, which is an ongoing effort. Um, I think that's something that, um, you know, if you, if you, are familiar with like the city's effort with the resilience plan. They have these, you know, chief resilience officers within each department. We're trying to do that uh, in, you know, a similar way before we kind of launch into any kind of like formal climate planning and, and whatnot. Um, and so, um, so the- So Lisa? Kind of first, yes, come on. All right, so, um, you know, precinct two had Danielle, have you already started talking to her? Um, and she was sort of leading up uh, what, what, uh, what the precursor of you uh, in precinct two, have you started making relationships with them uh, and and others uh, in the other precincts yet? Did you say Danielle in precinct two? Yeah. Uh, I have not worked with Danielle. I worked with Kristen Lee and Francis Nugent in precinct two. Um, I don't. It, yeah. Is there's been a lot of kind of people leaving the county. So is 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 Danielle still at the county at precinct two or? I don't know, but I, that's the person I started talking to before you were. You were hired and so that's why but i'll send you the information and, and you can check and see okay yeah that would be great yeah to your point Herman. i mean i think i have the, the strongest strongest relationships with precinct one staff and precinct two staff at this point so i actually have like ongoing conversations precinct two has been really involved with our clean energy strategy and then precinct one um with the climate justice planning and uh kind of um you know the kind of figure out like pathways forward with that for the county um okay Okay, yes, yeah, so I said that Daniel may no longer be long, yeah, may not be at the county anymore. So I think there was something similar with precinct one. I think their environment environmental policy person had also left to go on, you know, left to go to grad school. So, but yeah, but have constant conversations with those, those, both those precincts. Um, so probably one of the first things that we brought to court was our clean energy strategy. And I will kind of, and this is all kind of publicly available information. This is, uh, it was just a transmittal to court back in February. Um, if you click on that link, you can kind of click on the, you know, the RCA language and then click on the PDF that we created. But really this is um, helping us figure out A, what to do about our retail electricity power. <laughs> and then B, how do we um, kind of look at, a, at creating these like, resilience hubs around the county. So we have two different consultants helping us with that. Um, the retail electricity component at this point, um, Energy Edge is our consultant for that. And uh, keep in mind, the county's been purchasing 100% RECs for the last three years. So we want to go beyond RECs. We kind of want to um, you know, look at kind of structuring a long-term PPA uh, for either solar or wind. Um, Stephanie, does that link not work? Oh, no, the link works. OK. But, but um, I'm going to ask you to, to maybe be a little bit more um, simple in your terminology. Not everyone oh, sure. might know what a REC or a PPA is. OK, sure. Yeah, so REC. So, uh, re a renewable energy credit is really just buying like the attributes versus actually building kind of new generation adding you know green power uh to our ERCOT grid and so i would say kind of recs were more interesting probably like 10 10 years ago I, at the city we were doing recs you know like 10 years ago so um so with the ppa with the power purchase agreement we would actually be looking at building a new renewable energy generation asset you know could it be closer? We've talked to the BQ Energy folks who's helping develop the sunny, uh, sunny side solar farm. Uh, or are there also other projects, um, you know, kind of, you're all gonna, Elena, um, 
are there other projects also that make sense for us um, you know, elsewhere on, on Harris County property? Who knows? Um, and so that's what we have our consultants working on. Um, we're looking at um, 50 to 100 megawatts for, for that uh, part of our uh, green power kind of procurement. And that, that, that's going to happen a little farther out though. Right now, because of like just the interconnection queue issues, um, you might have, you might be following like the, the, that Department of Commerce anti-dumping tariff thing that's going on uh, with, I think it's, is it Oxen Solar? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but um, the, there's been kind of some issues on the, on the supply side for, for solar. So, you know, again, our consultants are kind of keeping on, on top of that and helping us figure out, yeah, how do we structure kind of a shorter term retail, you know, electricity, con electricity contract, and then really kind of move towards something that's, that makes uh, more of a difference. Um, in terms of our, our climate goals. Um, and then for the community side, we have a different group of consultants working on that with us. And the charge right now is actually identifying some really interesting or like sites around the county uh, for both solar and storage and potentially kind of adding on, or like keeping in mind like our EV pilot that we're, that we're working on. So this is kind of where these like two projects are, are, are intercepting. <laughs> so, um, so our, our consultants are, have identified potentially a, a site with the toll road authority where we'll be having our um, EV pilot with the law enforcement folks at the toll road um, and in seeing if solar storage and those EVs, like how does that pilot all work together? So we're actually gonna have a site visit there next week. Um, and, um, and then potentially looking at other sites around the county, like where does it make sense to have these critical assets that shouldn't ever go offline uh, during, you know, extreme heat events or extreme cold events or hurricanes um, and, and have these kind of lily pads for folks to kind of charge equipment and make sure that it's there for like first responders and that sort of thing. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the near term um, strategy for the community side. There might also, yes, Herman. So have you been talking to uh, Houston first too, because they uh, seem to want to have um, George R. Brown uh, um, be one of those sites. So are you going that far or are you just staying in, inside the county uh, with county assets? Oh, I, well, yeah, good point. I mean, this first is more of a city, kind of quasi city um, department. So not, it will probably be county's assets first. So, you know, are there community centers or libraries with um, our precincts? Uh, Harris Health is kind of part of the county. So, you know, are the opportunities with Harris Health to you know, have like solar on their parking lots and stuff like that, and, and kind of help make sure that those those systems don't ever go offline. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. I think there's opportunities. I mean, even outside of the city, you know, I think there. I haven't had a chance to kind of work with folks in like Deer Park and Pasadena, um, in those areas that are in the county that haven't been um, uh, kind of in the focus of the Houston Climate Action Plan, right? So like, where can we kind of best complement existing? Uh, efforts. Um, so yeah, so then back to the clean energy strategy, there's, you know, there's a, there've been lots of interesting ideas. It's just a matter of, do we have the capacity to do some of these really interesting things? <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, in terms of like aggregation, um, in terms of, uh, you know, you know, are there ways to carve out a part of our power purchase agreement and have that, you know, be some kind of residential kind of opt-in program for folks. Um, so, you know, we've, we've brainstormed a lot of things. Let's, let's see what happens. Hopefully we can get um, at least this pilot project going quickly. Um, so, so are probably... you guys going, are you, are, are you going to RFP this or are you gonna actually try to do it all yourself? Yeah, I think the intent right now is doing probably an RFI first um, and then seeing what, and then from there we're doing an RFP. So that's okay. So, so just just a, a note. We're getting back into jargon. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, yes. Be an RFI if you don't mind defining. Yes. So an RFI a request for information. So this is more about like seeing what's out there in the market. Who, who what kind of vendors are would be able to provide this service? And then the RFP would be a request for proposal. So then the then you know vendors then would actually put in a formal bid to say like we can do this project for X amount and that sort of thing. Um. So I'll probably jump kind of to the, our EV pilot, which is what went to court today. And let me send you that link if you are interested in reading the investment memo that we had to write. <laughs> so our EV pilot um, is for the engineering department and toll road authority. Now, 
it's somewhat of a misnomer because we actually have had EVs tried out in the county already. Push Control Services actually acquired 12 Chevy Bolts last year. Um, and so this was the first time I think we were really leaning on the Evolve Houston EIQ mobility study, um, which they also did for the city of Houston. They did one for us and then they actually re-ran it because we asked them to exclude any luxury vehicles, uh, anything that would be considered a luxury vehicle. So they kind of took Teslas out of the second study and Cadillacs, et cetera. So, um, so our engineering department will be um, trying out um, some of the Ford F-150 Lightnings and then the Ford E-Transit cargo vans. The toll road authority will actually be, it's a, it'll be a law enforcement pilot and um, they'll be using it for, you know, um, you know, patrol vehicles as well as kind of roadside assistance vehicles. So there's will also be some F-150 Lightnings and the Mustang Mach EVs. Um, so there's a total of 19 vehicles. Um, Debbie? Oh, you're on mute. Go, go ahead and finish the subject on electric vehicles, which oh, okay. is very important to hear first. Oh, sure. Um, so the, um, yeah, so there's will be 19 vehicles in this first round for those two departments. We're planning a, like a ride and drive event so that the employees can actually get a, a, a feel for the vehicles. Probably Hopefully we can actually get those vehicles that we're um, procuring. And in, it was actually voted um, unanimously today. Well, Commissioner Hagel was not at court today, but um, everyone else voted in favor. So anytime you can get like a unanimous vote, you're, you kind of breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> so um, if you haven't watched Commissioner's Court, I highly recommend just watching one. It's very exciting and dramatic. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so this hopefully will, you know, be able to place the order sometime in, end, of, uh, end of June. Um, you know, I've been talking to kind of our counterparts, the uh, like Dallas County, they did a similar procurement and placed their orders back in April. They, they did, yeah, 10 uh, Lightnings and 10 mach -E's, and they're going to get theirs delivered in five months. So a lot of the internal, you know, call, my colleagues have been asking, like, when are they going to be delivered? I'm like, I don't know. It kind of <laughs> depends on the dealerships, they, if they have any on the lot. Um, and then you probably have read a lot of the supply chain issue, issues. So, you know, it could be six months from now, it could be 24 months from now, we're not sure. Um, but in that time though, we are kind of figuring out what type of uh, EV charging infrastructure will be needed for these sites. Um, I, I've deployed charging stations when I was with the city of Houston, as well as at Rice, um, just was at Rice last Friday to show some of uh, my colleagues at the county and some of the consultants, the uh, solar powered charging station. Yes, yep, you did. <laughs> um, uh, the solar powered charging station in North Lot. And so, you know, are there opportunities to make sure that, you know, some of these assets that we're deploying are also resilient um, when, when the grid goes out too. So. Um, and so that, yeah, so as I mentioned, what's you know, the location? This, what's the location? Uh, yeah. Was that a question? Oh, no. Okay. Um, so, um, so yeah, so as we deployed this EV strategy, other ways to combine that with the clean energy side of things, um, if you've read about like the F-150 Lightnings, they have the capacity for bi-directional charging. And so in the, in the residential space, you know, they could potentially power a home, um, you know, during grid outages. So we're trying to understand if, if that's also the same in a commercial setting. If anyone knows the answer to that, we'd love to know. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, and so I think that this has kind of garnered some interest from other departments at the county. So hopefully we can kind of move to more departments and then um, kind of look at electric buses too. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of on the electric vehicle side of things. Uh, Debbie? Yeah, so I, I wanted to ask about conservation. I've been reading that the state of Texas uses far more energy per capita than almost any other state. And what I know is lighting. I know this group is getting a little tired of hearing me talk about lighting, but I don't think it's just a little bit. I think Houston probably uses four to five times as much LED light as is necessary for the exact same, actually for better visibility. And there seems to be very little knowledge on that. I've now uh, connected with a doctor, uh, Shen Xiao at uh, UT Public Health Science Center, and she specifically researches exterior lighting and health. 
Yeah. And um, what she she considers an environmental justice issue. So what we're doing is we're absolutely bombarding some poor areas with white light, and I don't know how they could possibly sleep. And that white light that's pointed outward is a double whammy. It's both wasted light, which has nothing to do with lighting what is lighting the street. And on top of that, the way it reacts with the eye means that the light that does fall in the street appears dimmer to our eye. So when you turn it down, use a lower glare version, which is a warmer version, then you need a lot less light to see just as well. And this is probably, I don't think it's just like 20% difference. I think it's many times too much light. And that's, that'd be a low hanging fruit. We'd actually be much more comfortable in Houston. The other thing is on transportation. My father, who was a Shell Petroleum geologist, was encouraged to carpool. His four man carpool, a 1970s gas guzzler, is the equivalent to a two man carpool in a Prius today. And he did a calculation showing that conservation is actually a lot faster than technology. So he showed me, and I did, he showed me the work. If you put a million cars on the road instantaneously, they get 100, gal 100 miles per gallon and replace cars, a million cars with 20 miles per gallon, it's a 1% reduction in our oil and gas use. So we need, I was just wondering if you're paying some attention also into energy use. I should not have to be drinking hot tea all summer long because buildings are over air conditions. Is there anything we can do on that level? Yes, yes, great question. Um, and, you know, again, as I mentioned, my background is in architecture. That's one of the first things that I asked when I got to the county. Are we benchmarking our buildings in portfolio manager at the very least? Um, the answer was no. And I'm kind of doing things I had to do for the city 10 years ago. Um, now, it's not to say the county's never done it before. I, I know for a fact that the county did benchmark buildings when they were a participant of our Houston Community Office Challenge program, because um, I knew the person in FPM who was doing it. But he has since left, and there hasn't been anyone who's been managing that. Um, the county actually doesn't have a, a current energy manager either. And so I'm kind of like taking the time when I have, you know, five minutes here or there, kind of going in and, and starting to kind of build, rebuild our portfolio manager account. So we start understanding what the energy use intensity of different building typologies are um, across our, our county assets. So keep in mind, we have, you know, jail facilities, we have the courthouses, we have libraries, we have, um, you know, the forensic science lab. Um, and so it's, it's, it's going to be kind of a kind of, you know, baby steps to that until I can find more help to help me really rebuild that portfolio. Um, another thing that we're working on currently is it's, it's still kind of an internal invest, it's, it's an internal memo at this point, but we're trying to understand, you know, are there ways to create some kind of green revolving fund? Um, it's something we couldn't do at the city. Uh, the, at that time, the, our finance director wasn't kind of, um, kind of amenable to that idea, but I think there's, there's more interest now at the county. Um, and again, when I was working at the city of San Antonio, they've had an energy efficiency revolving fund since 2011, which was seeded by ARA funding. Um, and so we've created a, a memo to kind of point to all these really successful uh, revolving funds. So city of San Antonio, Cook County has one for brownfields, King County has one for energy reduction also, um, and like energy water conservation projects. Uh, Harvard has had one since 2001, I believe. So there's a lot of in city of Pittsburgh, I mean, I can go on and on. And so I think with that, um, I, I'm hoping we can A, get an energy manager back to the county and actually start prioritizing these kind of energy efficiency projects um, and actually tracking them. So again, it's not like the county hasn't been doing these projects. I'm just saying they haven't been tracked very well because there's no one going back to actually understand if they're performing as designed. Um, and it's because, you know, yeah, because everyone's kind of pulled in many directions and there's no one dedicated to that. So if you're, if you're tying um, like an energy manager salary to that revolving fund, which is what is being done in San Antonio and in her staff member, then you have actual, um, you know, a desire to make sure that these projects pencil out and are actually kind of saving money. So, you know, maybe that's something that we can get going and then we can actually say this energy, this, this kind of energy star building or, um, you know, zero energy, net zero energy building should definitely have solar because we've already done the first thing of prioritizing energy efficiency and conservation and then adding uh, solar in storage, right? So that's, that's what I've been trying to kind of advocate for. Um, we actually went to tour Precinct 4's net zero energy building back in maybe last month or so. Um, this was a, a project that uh, the previous county engineer had had pitched to Commissioner uh, Cagle, and it's a really great project. Um, has geothermal on site, has solar on site, um, but no one's tracking the, the actual energy usage at this point. And so I kind of went back 
and I was like, well, if it's supposed to be net zero, let's 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 see if it is. And so I was kind of doing all the um, you know inputting all the data, reach out to the MEP engineer because I think they were trying to track it too. But then we realized that the solar uh, PV system had gone offline after nine months. So I still don't know if it's actually net zero, but hopefully it is. <laughs> um, we need to kind of figure out. Um, how to get that communication back online so we can actually kind of see if the solar is kind of offsetting um, the energy usage of that of that facility. So, um, I'm not, did that answer your question, Debbie? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Um, I'm not sure who was next, but Jamie's the one on my left. So let's go with Jamie. Hello, Lisa. Hi, Jamie. <laughs> Good to see your lady face. Um, I, so two, to kind of two parts. So is the county responsible for the paving on the roads and residential areas? Um, first question, yeah. Yes and no, depends. I think it depends on, you know, if you're in an unincorporated area, maybe. If it's in the city, it, it could be a shared thing. I mean, it's kind of an interesting partnership, right? Um, you know, for example, the Houston, or the Houston bike plan has really great ideas, but then Precinct One has put in a lot of money for actual implementation of those, of those, of uh, the the bike infrastructure, and so is Precinct Two. So, you know, it kind of depends on. Where well, you are. the reason I ask, and then there's one more thing I'll ask about, and then I'll be done and just hear whatever you have to say. But, but my the reason I asked about that is I've noticed in lower income neighborhoods that when they repave road, they're doing it with dark, dark, tarry asphalt, right? which for one lets off fumes on a hot day, which we know we have plenty of, and it adds to urban heat island effect and thus raises, raises not just the energy usage, but the bills on people who are already struggling. Um, so I think maybe there could be a partnership between the city and county or something about that to have higher albedo, which is, uh, means like the lighter, the more it reflects the sun and is better. So the concrete doesn't hold on to it and then release it at night. Right. Yeah. That's why it's, it's usually warmer in the city than in the suburbs. Yeah, I agree. Uh, actually, but yeah. I feel like they're also doing that in affluent neighborhoods because I, I think they just repaved Crockett, um, like where Houston Avenue and Crockett Street is, and that's all kind of black tar asphalt also. So I but that I'm, just stop altogether. That should just yeah, stop I, altogether. Yeah. No, I I agree. I mean, I think the county engineer's office actually has really embraced the envision rating system, and I have a feeling. Um, you know, like once they kind of figure out the actual deployment of that um, in, in their projects, that, you know, uh, high albedo materials will be prioritized. But I haven't had, a, you know, I haven't had that level of conversation with county engineers office yet. I've been trying to work with their buildings team first, because that seems to be the the most need in terms of like benchmarking energy of our buildings, that sort of thing. But yeah, I, I think you're right. The, you know, looking at the infrastructure um, projects that they're working on, you know, are there ways to prioritize? Um, um, my yeah. last point, just real quick, and yes. then I'll, I'll get off is I'm all for, I would love to hear about, know about if you plan to work on, or it's something you're interested at least in pedestrian and wildlife um, crossing bridges, you know, but also for bikes. Mm -hmm. um, and also to kind of break down that transit car oriented neighborhood setup, right? Um, and then the other thing um, would be sort of plugging uh, what Nancy Edwards is doing, wanting to go into neighborhoods and give away trees and stuff to folks and planting trees around those areas, especially the ones that have, you know, like the concrete plants and such near them. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Um, Neil? Great, hello. Um, I'm interested. Um, I'm interested. So often, the legislature um, undoes progressive policy. Um, my favorite example is was Galveston's plastic bag ban to choke the sea turtles that they undid. Um, so I'm interested in how um, the external political situation, um, the legislature uh, undoing stuff, and increasingly just threats to basic democracy. Um, I'm wondering um, if the external political situation impacts what you do. Uh, is it a consistent presence in the deliberations and policy decisions you make and, and, and how you factor that in? Thanks. Yeah, really good question. Actually kind of had a, a conversation with a, a foundation recently 
because we do have the desire to work on the climate justice or climate action to be determined plan. Um, and, and I got her thoughts on that and she was saying, you know, we're, we're much more closely tied to the state than the city is, right? So, um, so the advice was maybe we do it more quietly um, because even in the, was it the last ledge where when a lot of the cities were coming out with climate plans, like there was kind of rumors of the ledge wanting to kind of not allow cities to have climate plans and, and that sort of thing. And so we're gonna have to kind of think about that um, and you probably, if you've, you know, kept in touch with kind of local county stuff, there's been a lot of interesting kind of innovative things that the county has tried to do that has had ramifications later on in the next legislative session, right? So, um, so I think, yeah, we, I, we are keeping that in mind. It's just a matter of, um, you know, being very in tune with the local government code and also keeping tabs with like what our other county entities are doing. So I, I have pretty good conversations with Travis County, um, have like started making inroads with Dallas County. And at this point, you know, Travis County has a climate action plan, but it's it's all internally focused. It's kind of all county operations only. And and th that's okay. They haven't they haven't done an outward facing one. Um, and so when we when we move into that space, I think we'll just have to, you know, just think through what that looks like. So we can't make policies, we can't make like, ordinances, we can't mandate things, but maybe we could do things in other ways with, you know, with programs or incentives and that sort of thing. Um, or maybe part like looking at the projects that we work on that do in, impact communities. Like to Jamie's point, you know, maybe it's, it's looking at the infrastructure projects and how, how do those have um, kind of climate positive in, in, uh, impacts and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I want to be sure I, I don't forget folks in the in the chat. Um, so I think I saw um, Madeline's question about e-bike credits. Um, Madeline, was that the city and county of Denver? That um, I'm not sure which entity actually uh, did it, but it just was the first time that I saw on a local level someone offering that type of incentive, not like, you know, in the infrastructure bill or something federally. Yeah. No, and, that's, and I know that Harris County did like the childcare um, tax credit program. So that was also a like very localized credit. Uh, seems like it could be distributed similarly. Yeah, that child tax credit thing or the kind of child kind of support program thing may have been funded by ARPA. And my understanding with ARPA funds, we have a managing director who's kind of managing that that uh, that pot of funding from the federal government. Uh, a lot of those are already kind of allocated to different projects with the county. So it could be like public health, could be kind of justice focused, that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, I, I think with Denver's interesting because they, they are combined. It's, it's, it's like San Francisco. They're a city and county of, of Denver. So um, so they might have a little bit more flexibility of, of having like the benefits of what a city can do, um, that sort of thing. I. I don't know if that answered your question, but um, I know City of Austin has some interesting kind of um, policies internally for electrification of fleet. I think it has something with e-bikes too. It's it's mostly focused on vehicles, but I think I think there might be something for e-bikes. Um, but but I mean, it's good to kind of bring that up. I don't know if that's um, maybe that's something that we figure out in the climate planning effort. Um, let's see. Um, David asks, is the dark asphalt the kind made with rubber, rubber, recycled rubber? I don't know. That's a good question. I I would guess no, but I would have to check with our engineer's office. What's interesting about that is I've encountered it on US highways. And not only does it make it noisier inside the cockpit of the vehicle, but also it decreases gas mileage. So it's it, it's kind of a mixed blessing. Mm -hmm. and, um, Nancy asked if the county is planting trees. If so, where are there opportunities for volunteers to plant trees? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure with our uh, with it, between flood control and our county engineer's office, I'm sure there are projects. Um, I haven't been looped in on that. Maybe the precincts are doing it too. So, um, but I haven't. I ha there isn't necessarily at this point a um, a coordinated, you know, tree planting program at this point. I would say. If there is, I'm not in those conversations. <laughs> um, Thanks, Stephanie. Yes, ARPA. Um, let's see. Jaime Gonzalez. We haven't heard from you yet. <laughs> hey, Lisa. Thanks so much for, for being here tonight and, and for the Houston Climate Movement putting this on because I think these conversations are very important. I think for those of us who've been working with the city and the county, 
Um, we're starting to see some signs of where the city and the county can work together more proactively around climate justice and climate adaptation. Um, are you perceiving that um, that there are going to be more opportunities to have more of an integrative approach between the city and the county here in the next uh, couple of years? I, I hope so. Um, I've had kind of conversations with the offices, uh, with the Houston, um, Houston's Office of you know, Sustainability and Resilience. It's been hard to kind of continue those conversations. Um, but, you, you know, for instance, and I know you're kind of, um, I think more broadly, but I'm trying to think of like one, one specific example that I've been trying to coordinate with them on is just EV infrastructure deployment. And especially in terms of like equitably deploying EV charging stations, how can we complement what they're doing and make sure that, you know, we're not duplicative in, in certain areas. And that's like one thing I'm, I'm trying to kind of get a hold of them right now. Um, I might just kind of reach their fleet director um, and, and kind of chat with them about that. But, but yeah, to your point, I mean, yes, I think climate justice in terms of adaptation, resilience efforts, yes, there needs to be that type of, you know, regional approach to coordination and, and planning for sure. Yeah, we're just so you know, like we're about to restart conversations between the county and city around urban heat. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a place I think where we can really kind of lean in, everybody can lean in together, which is a, a good place. Yeah, yeah. In terms of like our, our kind of planning effort for, around the climate justice, uh, climate action planning um, kind of path is really partnering with public health and pollution control services. So we do intend to kind of have that kind of um, cross-cutting theme of, you know, health equity, uh, climate justice, climate, you know, um, kind of planning in terms of what the county can can kind of um, make a difference in. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Carmen? Thank you, Lisa. Um, this is very interesting. Um, I would like to kind of um, talk to you a little bit about what opportunities do you see for energy efficiency in homes? Our mm -hmm. campaign is specifically, <clears throat> I'm sorry, specifically focus on retrofitting homes. And we'd like to know, do you see any possibility to collaborate? We were talking to Lara Cottingham, and after that, we're talking to a couple of different uh, people in the city, but we haven't been able to move the needle that much. And we recognize that the community is what they need, right, to climate proof their homes to really weather the storm of climate change. So what, what are you here on the county level? Yeah, I'm 100% I'm with you. Um, I know through our community services department, they have a home repair program, which does include weatherization as part of the uh, kind of menu of options uh, for, for, um, for rebates. But I was kind of looking at their brochure, and I think because it's funded by CDBG funds or something, that it's only focusing on Harris County unincorporated uh, areas. Um, that might be because the, the city has its own kind of weatherization program either through, is it through Rip Baker Ripley? I could be misspeaking, but um, um, but I think there's, I've talked to the director at community services department to kind of figure out, is there a way to elevate energy efficiency and weatherization in that program instead of kind of burying it under all the different items and then maybe adding some kind of like, plus like after you've done the weatherization, let's say we create a new program for like solar and storage also only after you do the weatherization first. So, um, so yes, I, I'm 100% with you. I, if there's a way to kind of figure out how we can find funding for that, I think we, we that would be um, something that either is maybe a strategy within our climate justice plan, or maybe that's something we can, if we find funding earlier than, you know, if, if there's funding through IJA, the infrastructure, um, infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, sorry, I can't find my words tonight, um, but you know, the infrastructure bill, <laughs> if there's funding through that, maybe we can create programs like that that would help um, serve that community need, but I, I, I'm, I'm that, that would be really good if, if we can also tie it into solar, right? But right now we're getting stuck with um, <clears throat> what they call um, the fair maintenance. So yes. people that they haven't maintained their homes that they cannot qualify for weather stations, so much less for solar. So I they know. should be some kind of connectors right there. Right. We, you know, can, okay. Yeah, we're, we're, we're in the same space with, with this, with the county, you know, we're kind of like prioritizing this deferred maintenance issues with roof like you know roof leaks and that sort of thing we can't get in, in ahead of ourselves enough to get to those kind of high impact projects to reduce um energy consumption so yeah so it's kind of yeah those those are parallel issues <laughs> um miss dolores i see your hand up also yes hello uh miss lisa i wanted to ask the question that i thought that you said that crockett street was uh paid with asphalt, 
you know, tar and uh, gravels. Yes. I, I misunderstand you. Oh, yes. We're, uh, I think we were just talking about kind of, you know, areas that have been being repaved. And I was just saying that, you know, I was driving the other day and, and saw that that area was being repaved with black tar asphalt. Um, well, I can understand because uh, I never really seen over there in First Ward and Sixth Ward pavement with, you know, tar and gravel. But here in the Fifth Ward area, for decades on top of decades, that has been done to us. We not only suffering with creosote, tar poisoning, but that pavement, it makes you ill too, yeah. especially in the summertime. summertime. Mm -hmm. It like actually uh, melts and start getting sticky again. Yeah. So I just want to bring that to your attention. I yeah. know I go out there in the county and almost every street I ever rode in the county is concrete. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Think, yes, appreciate Yeah, Thank you for that comment. And I think that's, you know, to, I think Jaime's point, this coordination between the city and county, like if there's a way to, you know, just make a blanket policy that we don't use these, um, these kind of unhealthy materials and that, that create kind of worse urban heat island effect. I'm gonna turn on my light really quickly, but I'm still listening. Um, Betty, I, I'm, I'm still here, I'm gonna turn on my light. Yes, uh, Lisa, you were talking about uh, electrical vehicles a little earlier. And uh, I recently bought a hybrid. Uh, and uh, and I bought a hybrid um, because of my knowledge of the uh, um, oil and gas industry and the effect of oil and gas on uh, uh, climate concerns. Um, I'm 71 years old. I don't expect that I will ever be buying an electric car, but I'm trying to understand this hybrid car. Recently, I was coming home in the pouring down rain, this past Thursday night to be exact, and it was pouring down and I hit the medium on the street that I live on and I burst a tire. Before I burst the tire, I never knew that that hybrid came without a spare. And I found it out the next morning because I was close to home when I hit the medium, thank God. And I didn't look at it until the next morning. So I called the salesperson who stole me the car and asked him why he didn't let me know that I didn't have a spare. That still concerns me because I recently lost my husband. And there are many women who buy cars and may not have access to AAA or some other roadside assistance. And it could be potentially very, very dangerous if they do something like burst their tire in a dangerous area and have no access for assistance to fix that tire. I'm also learning other things that are potentially dangerous for women because we don't traditionally know what to do if we don't have some type of roadside assistance. So I wanna ask you, where do you think is the best place for us to go to get questions answered when you're not accustomed to hybrid cars or electric cars and you want to be educated? Now I know I need to go back and get the AAA. I got rid of it after my husband died and I was trying to uh, lower the bills that I had to pay by myself but I'm gonna put the AAA back on there. I also have a pump in my car that I don't know how to use. And I'm being told by people that if I used it, it would help lower my gas pump. 
that okay if I answer that question? Because I've been driving, a, I, that was one of my concerns also. I've been driving a hybrid since 2012. I have a Ford Fusion hybrid, and I love the low gasoline cost. But I don't think it's only hybrids. I understand the batteries capacity, the ba batteries having to be in the trunk is one of the reasons they don't put spares in. But I think I've been told that even some other cars are using uh, pumps and, or, or tire fix of flats instead of uh, spare tires. I started, I definitely have AAA. I started to consider a flat tire just something like any other um, any other problem that stops you. And I, by the way, I just had my seventh flat tire on a Saturday night. They're always Saturday night when everything's closed. And I, I don't know what it is with this car. I've never had so many flats. But um, but you, you, the AAA though solves the problem. And I think a basic membership is, is low. Also some some uh, cars like my bought, bought my Ford, they actually had their own um, come get you. They, there was a number you could call Ford. And by the way, they're doing, I haven't bought an electric yet. And I'd like to speak for electrics. I understand they're very expensive, but if the affluent people will buy electric cars now, they will lower gasoline costs for everybody else. So I think sometimes you have to start out with an expensive technology and let it play out. So let the affluent people buy LED bulbs first or electric cars first. That lowers um, overall use. That in turn lowers costs for lower income people. And then over time with economy of scale, um, then everybody can eventually afford these things. Um, but I would highly recommend with any car that doesn't have a spare to definitely have some sort of um, uh, AAA or something like that. I have definitely used AAA um, for flat tires just in Fort Davis and Fort, I was able to drive there. But And the other thing is that I do carry a, a, an air compressor. So if I don't have, if I have a slow leak, I can air up my tire, at least drive to have it fixed. But that is a disadvantage with cars that have batteries. They can't fit the spare tire. We just need another way of dealing with that. And uh, who would you recommend that uh, women who are, are single for one reason or another talk to? Because I'm told by the salesmen um, at the dealerships that they don't get a very concise learning about a hybrid and electric cars. Yeah. And, and who do we go to? to I, I ask? Yeah, first of all, I have thought about buying a tire just to have in my in my garage in case I, or you could carry one. I mean, it would use up a good part of your trunk, but you could conceivably carry a spare, like one of the smaller spare tires. Um, but I, I really think that I think the trick is AAA. They will come get you. They won't strand you. And just and you need it for other things besides flat tires. I, I had this car hasn't stranded me for anything else. But I had another car that had electrical problems and stranded me for other reasons. I think every single woman needs AAA or something like that. They will come get you and they won't leave you by yourself on the side of the road. It's just part of driving. Ms. Betty, and, and if you want to get connected to uh, Ms. Uh, Debbie, that they can give you more advice of the, the meeting, that will be great because there's still more people who have questions. Okay. Or Lisa. Thank you, Ms. Betty. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Thank you. Uh, Herman? All right. So um, I, I, I think I understand your, your tactics on not having uh, a formal. Um, a plan, like climate action plan, and you're actually going project by project. But um, in, in order for us to help you, um, we need to know what you want us to help you on and trying to get the, you know, the community to back you up. So um, short of not having a resiliency plan or action plan because you're trying to avoid uh, state scrutiny, how do you want us to help you? Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe I, I didn't make that point clear. I'm not saying that we're not going to have a formal plan. I think we, we will. We just have to do it in a thoughtful way that doesn't kind of trigger the state ledge to, to kind of, you know, slap our hands sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So internally, we've been kind of thinking through this process, starting to have conversations with foundations to see if there's funding um, through some environmentally kind of centric foundations to help us uh, kind of get the planning process going forward. Um, we, we, we're thinking maybe maybe it's, 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 it's good to kind of lead with the county departments first. Uh, Clark County took this approach where they kind of did an internal kind of facilitation of the departments and getting departments um, to think about what kind of climate programs they can integrate into their um, actions and then kind of lead into a more community facing um, planning effort. So that's kind of the thinking right now um, right now, we're again, we're trying to secure that funding first to make sure we can kind of get you know the facilitation 
we still need to do a greenhouse gas inventory. That might be something that our interns help with this summer um, or, you know, might need like consultant help. So that's, so to your point, Herman, we're kind of doing both things, right? We're trying to show some projects that, that demonstrate progress, uh, but at the same time, figure out kind of, at the, you know, how do we get the planning effort moving forward too, so. All right, well, you're going, to, so you're going to let us know when, when we need to start chiming in because you, know, yes. you, you seem to be going full steam and I think it's the right way to do things, but we want, we want to help. So that's why we want to, and we haven't been bugging you. So that's why we want to make sure that we're, we're tuned in when, when we're ready, when you're ready to help for, for us to help you. Yes, when, you know, we, we've had kind of initial conversations in terms of, um, you know, there's certain grants out there already that require a community-based organization to be at the beginning of, of this planning process. And so we're, we're thinking through, you know, there's, there might be a local foundation that's wanting to be the local match. And so we're kind of thinking through that, you know, what, which community-based organization would that be to kind of help us be that, that, um, that on the ground kind of grassroots group to, to help, help, help us get to the, to the communities that haven't been involved with climate planning yet, right? So again, really focusing on what's outside of Houston and um, especially precinct two, right? Areas that are along the ship channel and in the refinery areas, how do we get to those communities um, that weren't, that may not have been involved with the Houston climate and climate effort, so. Okay. Debbie? Uh, I, th I think I had that up earlier and I'm not even, I don't even remember what it was for, so go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm trying to, uh, Claire, did you want to read your question or I can read it out loud? Sure, I can, I can tell you what I was thinking. I just, yeah. I was writing about EV infrastructure and I learned about the bipartisan infrastructure bills like National Highway Corridors Plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was just wondering if you know, like it seems like it's very state by state type of thing. So I was wondering if you know if the state of Texas has done anything to designate corridors in Texas or if there's anything that the county can do to be involved in that or yes. access some of the funding. Yeah, so that was, um, I was on a Clean Cities Coalition call this morning and that was brought up. So I think in terms of um, the different MPOs, which is, you know, H at Metropolitan Planning Organization, um, our local one is HJC, the Houston Galveston Area Council. Uh, I know that that's kind of part of their charge to help kind of bring together their counties uh, to work on this. I know that NCT COG, the North Central Texas Council of Governments, is very active in this space. And I think they actually just had uh, a workshop on like zero energy, like corridors. Uh, I wasn't able to attend, maybe some folks here um, were able to attend that, that meeting. And so, yeah, so we, we definitely wanna be part of that conversation. Um, I'm just kind of waiting for our Clean Cities Coalition folks to let us know locally, like more can get involved for sure. Uh, and to your point, actually, that's something that the Tolbert Authority is really interested in. Um, one last thing I'll kind of drop in the chat is today, again, um, as part of on the court agenda, they they put out this like $50 million active transportation plan, which is actually pretty exciting for me, like coming from the TBM space uh, at Rice, kind of really, you know, thinking beyond mobility, thinking what I would say at Rice, like thinking outside the car. I think Hector is really, uh, sorry, the Toll Road Authority is really thinking about that. How can you kind of activate the spaces um, in around that Toll Road infrastructure? Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry, that was just, I didn't copy the whole thing. Um, and so I, I, in, you know, in having them be part of this, uh, EV pilot with us, they, they're even having kind of thoughts of, you know, would there be fast charging along like the toll roads, potentially, um, toll road booths or like the kind of drive off areas or toll road plaza, sorry, um, you know, to tie in the EV infrastructure kind of high speed network, fast charging network, sorry, <laughs> um, I was like thinking of internet. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I think there's, there's kind of that kind of thinking in, in, in terms of like what we have control over at the county, which is the, the toll roads. Um, but yeah, to your point, I think, yeah, we, we definitely wanna be in that conversation. Because the other, I mean, the one other interesting thing I just noticed in the plan was that they prioritized, like they had a set of things they were trying to prioritize. And one of the ones they were prioritizing was low income and minority neighborhoods that don't have as much access. And I just yeah. wasn't sure since it's such a big metropolitan area and not necessarily exactly along these corridors, how that would be and how that crossover would work, but yeah, good point. That'll be discussed. So yeah, yeah, trying to keep an eye out on all those funding opportunities. I think if we can get help with some kind of grant writer, that would be that would help 
help me a lot um, because I can I can barely stay above water with these projects that I'm working on now. So, um, Jamie asks, uh, is there any talk about banning development on green fields? Um, I don't. Well, that's a good question. I mean, in in terms of uh, maybe in a roundabout way, I know they're like between like the uh, um, the sorry, flood control district and like community services department, they have different buyouts of, you know, flooded properties. So, you know, there's, they're, they're trying to kind of, um, um, you know, ban development on, not ban development, but like kind of discourage development on, on floodplain areas. And I, I've been trying to figure out like, are there better ways to use that land? Like, can we, can we activate those spaces somehow? So, um, so, but I, Jamie, I don't, I don't know if I have a good answer for, for you on that question. Um, I, I agree, <laughs> I agree. Um, I've actually been part of this uh, study with Precinct 1 in the Parks Board. The, the Parks Board is doing a study for um, Precinct, Precinct 1's um, wet bottom and dry bottom uh, detention basins. Um, I may know something about that. Well, maybe I know that already. Um, but there's kind of, there's kind of thinking, you know, are there better uses for that, for those um, detention basins, other than just kind of letting them be detention basins? Again, are, are there ways to kind of activate those green spaces? And I was saying, like, I know it's a floodplain, but can you can you do solar and storage there? I don't know. I've just asked that a couple of times, but I don't know if anyone has a good good answer to that. I think I've seen case studies where there have been developments uh, of solar in floodplains, but that's probably not the best type of land for that. Um, Ed asked, California requires new homes to have rooftop solar. Any chance that Texas will ever be progressive? I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't, I know for as a county, we wouldn't be able to require it. Maybe that's something that Houston could do. I, I think there's ways, like if we can, if there's ways for us to kind of reduce the cost of solar, like let's say we somehow leverage, leverage our buying power at the county, you know, if we're doing like a big solar and storage project, is there a way to kind of share that reduced cost with residents somehow? Like that might be the, the way we, we approach that. But I don't think we'd ever be able to require new homes. Uh, I know the city has the solar ready um, residential built, uh, residential code, but my husband and I bought our house that was uh, that was under that code, and um, it was solar ready. But they put the conduit in the wrong place. So when we had our solar installed, they still had to add conduit in a different location. <laughs> so um, yeah, Stephanie, any other? Question from folks that I missed. Um, there was just uh, one quick one about Whisper Valley east of Austin. Um, if, if folks aren't familiar with that, it's a development, uh, um, kind of a suburban area where the homes are um, equipped with solar panels. They also have a geothermal um, that basically connects to all the different homes and uh, helps both cool and heat the homes. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's any any plans for those kinds of developments around here. Yeah, I mean, geothermal has been a pretty hot topic in, in our office. So again, we mentioned the, the net zero energy facility in, in Tomball, which is, excuse me, Precinct 4 Service Center, which has geothermal. So, um, you know, we're looking we're looking into that still. Like, does are, are there a pop, potential opportunities for other county developments that could, that could use a geothermal system? So um, I'm going to go ahead and drop my email in the chat in case anyone has um, questions later on. Make sure I typed it correctly. Yeah. So feel free to reach out to me um, if, yeah, if you have further questions. And uh, I'm, yeah, happy to answer any other ones if you have any right now. <laughs> Great. Well, we actually do need to finish up with uh, the rest of our meeting. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, which we don't we don't have much ground to cover, fortunately. But um, um, Lisa, thank you so so much for joining us. We really appreciate you coming to speak with us. And everyone, if you go down to the the bottom bar, you'll see reactions, and you can celebrate Lisa by clapping your hands or. <laughs> Sending some love or thumbs up or however you like. I could use one of Nancy's really good hugs. Nancy knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, I'm going to jump and sit down and put on my my comfy home, house clothes now. So <laughs> have a good night, everyone.
Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.